Hello, my friends. I'm Ruth Berta, and I will once again be serving as your liturgist this week. Welcome. Let us now begin with our call to worship. If you are tired from carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. Take the yoke I give you. Put it on your shoulders and learn from me. I am gentle and humble and you will find rest. This yoke is easy to bear and this burden is light. Christ calls us to come to worship, to check the baggage we carry, baggage weighed down by worry and distraction, to rest from the things that are troubling us, to learn what Christ can teach of life, to realize what we can offer to others. Let us begin with our unburdened celebration and worship of God. Please now join us in singing our hymn of the day. We continue today with our fall sermon series, Baggage Check. Today we will once again take the time to get to the root, the history and the meaning of words and practices in the Christian tradition that have for one reason or another carried a lot of baggage or distorted understandings. This week's Baggage Check, Prayer and Prosperity. We'll do our best toward a better understanding with 1 Thessalonians 5.21 as our guide. We'll test everything and hold fast to what is good. Though there are many scriptures to address this topic, let's just begin with two. Our first reading is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 12 to 13 and 16 to 18. And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. Be cheerful no matter what. Pray all the time. Thank God no matter what happens. This is the way God wants you, who belong to Christ Jesus, to live. Our second comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4 and 9 through 13. One day he was praying in a certain place. When he finished, one of his disciples said, Master, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. So he said, when you pray, say, Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you'll get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will open. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. If your little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? If your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? 
As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. And don't you think the Father who conceived you in love will give the Holy Spirit when you ask of him? This week, thanks, Ruth, for doing a nice introduction for us, we are going to dig in, do a baggage check when we think about the word prayer. And, and not just the word prayer, but what our ideas about prayer are, especially through the lens of the prosperity gospel. You know, that ask for whatever you want and you'll get it gospel. The one that like turns God into Santa Claus. But, um, this branch of Christianity, per, per um, author Kate Baller, who wrote a book entitled Everything Happens for a Reason and Other Lies that I Love. Well, she says that this theology, this branch of Christianity, promises a cure for, for all tragedy. Its bold and central claim is that God will give you your heart's desire, money in the bank, a healthy body, a thriving family, and boundless happiness. As if tuning into God is like tuning into the Disney Channel with hopes of a happy ever ending result. Now, for any of you out there that have paid attention to the, the list of tragedies and global upheaval recently, it seems obvious that this theology is falling short. And for those folks who had bought into it, pun intended, it has left many of them disenfranchised, and not just disenfranchised with the church or with Christianity, but with God, with God as a whole. It seems to me that our misunderstanding of the power of prayer has done a lot of damage. So let's take some time and let's look at this a little closely, a little more closely through scripture and believe it or not, science. First with scripture, the Apostle Paul talks a whole lot about prayer. He, he also prays a lot. He prays a lot for the people that he cares for and who he's leading and, and serving as a leader in the churches, friends, family. He prays for everybody. He prays for everything. In his letter to the Thessalonians, he instructs all of us to be joyfully praying without ceasing. Praying without ceasing but never mentions that our joyful praying without ceasing life will not have foibles and trials and snares. This is something else he wrote in Thessalonians. He said, God not only loves you very much, but also has put his hand on you for something special. When the message we preached came to you, it wasn't just words. Something happened in you. The Holy Spirit put steel in your convictions. You paid careful attention to the way we lived among you and determined to live that way yourselves. In imitating us, you imitated the Master. Although great trouble accompanied the Word, you were able to take great joy from the Holy Spirit, taking the trouble with the joy and the joy with the trouble. Hmm. No order form for a BMW attached to that letter, Paul? No, I don't see one. But still so many, especially in North America, pair prayer with the commercialized understanding of prosperity. Mistakenly equating being well off with one's well-being. It certainly lured Dr. Kate Baller in for a spell when she was just about 18 years old. She decided to follow the Yellow Brick Road. By the time Kate was 25, she was so intrigued that she started traveling around the country interviewing these PG celebrities, that is prosperity gospel celebrities, to write a thesis. And inevitably, she wrote the first history of the movement from beginning to end. She spent years talking to televangelists who claimed spiritual guarantees of divine dividends and discovered that there were a growing number of North Americans who were buying into the idea of the purchase power of God. And why not believe when witnessing the extravagant lifestyles of these powerful and popular evangelists unashamedly jetting around in their private jets and living in these multi-million dollar homes as evidence of God's love. Faithful belief in the big God 
will guarantee a big payoff. But let's be honest. She also found that actually most, if not the majority of people who were buying into the prosperity gospel, weren't looking to it so they could get a Mercedes Benz and a Bentley. And Powler found that many, if not most of these followers were downtrodden and looking for ways to escape poverty and faith, uh, a faithful healing. Uh, they, they wanted their lives to not just be prosperous, but to be rid of pain and sorrow. This is what she said. People wanted salvation from bleak medical diagnoses. They wanted to see God rescue their broken teenagers and their misfiring marriages. They wanted a modicum of power over the things that had ripped their lives apart at the seams. The prosperity gospel is a theodicy, she continues, which means it's an explanation for the problem of evil. It is an answer to the questions that take our lives apart. Like why do some people get healed and some people don't. The prosperity gospel, she writes, looks at the world as it is and promises a solution. It guarantees that faith will always make a way. It was the kind of theodicy that Bauer lived by until, until she received her stage four diagnosis of cancer and found herself on her knees, not only praying for healing, but ended up asking God, why? Why me? Bowler's book joins many others seeking a better understanding of the provision of God, this undefinable, mysterious God that we pray to. Rabbi Harold Kushner's famous When Bad Things Happen to Good People is a fantastic source and I think a good place for us to check our baggage, you know, unpack this word and this idea of prayer and provision. You know, the difference between praying for our well-being versus our being well off. Here's a beautiful quote. I don't know why one person gets sick and another does not, Rabbi Kushner writes, but I can only assume that some natural laws which we don't understand are at work. I cannot believe that God sends illness to a specific person for a specific reason. I don't believe in a God who has a weekly quota of malignant tumors to distribute and consults his computer to find out who deserves one most or who could handle it best. What did I do to deserve this? Is an understandable outcry from a sick and suffering person. But it is really the wrong question. Being sick or being healthy is not a matter of what God decides that we deserve. The better question is, if this has happened to me, what do I do now and who is there to help me do it? It becomes much easier to take God seriously as the source of moral values if we don't hold him responsible for all the unfair things that happen in the world. So, what is it that we should pray for? I claim no monopoly on understanding the mystery of prayer, but I think beginning with Kushner's suggestion, and that paired with what Jesus left us with in today's gospel lesson is a pretty good start, don't you think? The Gospel of Luke presented through Eugene Peterson's interpretation called The Message. It's a contemporary condensed presentation of the Lord's Prayer. It, it finds its heart, I think. And this is how Eugene Peterson writes it within the gospel. Father, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and our forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. It certainly isn't the flowery version that we're used to that we see presented in Matthew's gospel or that we're going to be using later today in the service, but it gets to the point. This prayer has to do with God's presence and guidance. That's the provision. Immediately following that prayer, however, in the same gospel is probably where most prosperity gospel people 
hitched their wagon. And it is when Jesus said, ask and you'll get it. Seek and you'll find it. Knock and the door will be open. But is the prosperity gospel summation of this really the intent of Jesus? So, Jesus, the Hebrew, used a Hebrew prayer template called the Kaddish. The prayer is a beautiful combination or selection of formulas of prayer with the first and principal part of it being a prayer for the coming of the kingdom of God. Parts of the Kaddish date from the first century BCE. Written mostly in Aramaic, which was a spoken language of a whole lot of Jews in the 5th century BCE, or before Christ, until the 5th century CE, or after Christ, or AD. It was recited not only by priests, but by the common people. The Kaddish did not originate in the synagogue, but essentially in a, in a Hebrew school. At the close of each school day, the students and their rabbi or their teacher would rise and they would praise God's name, kind of the way we use the doxology. So what about this ask, seek, and knock stuff, right? It, if we were to really just scan through our scriptures, especially the New Testament, but not just the New Testament, we're going to find a central theme about this provision that God keeps talking about and people keep writing about. It, it, it runs through. And, and that provision is the awareness of God's presence and understanding that and then sensing the peace that passes all understanding. It allows our heart, minds, and souls to rest comfortably in the arms and the Spirit of God. Or as Paul writes, the Holy Spirit puts steel in our convictions. Or, or he writes later in 1 Thessalonians, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Great. Thanks. I got God's spirit down, down, down in my heart. But how does that help me pay my rent or face the difficulties right now? Well, hear me say this. I absolutely believe in a powerful God. And I believe in a God that listens. I believe in a God that directs and inspires. I believe that that's what God's provision to us is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and it can shift and change things it can move things that need to be moved especially a moral compass or inspired intuitive solutions I also believe that knowing that people are praying for us does have an impact on our recovery gives us a peace of mind to face the difficult situations when we lean into this God to whom we pray. Now, this, though, is hard to monitor scientifically, in accessory prayer, that is. But what about the effect of prayer on the prayer? Hmm. Here is a bit of info for you of little faith sit back. It's wonderful. This gets me really excited. I love spirit and mystery, but I also love science. I love science. So for those who think that everything I'm getting ready to talk about is, is spiritual mumbo jumbo, I want you to hold on because science comes in. We have had major advances in neuroscience. We actually can see real time effects of of prayer and faith on our brain as it responds. And then we can monitor the long-term effects of prayer and meditation on a person's well-being. The, the ways that people encounter God is through the brain writes Mike McCarg, AKA Science Mike, one of my favorites. 
So contrary to some popular notions, faith, praying, it's good for you. Think about this. Who of us doesn't get worked up? I mean, we get totally worked up with fear and worry and anger and rage, stressed over just daily living, and then, oh, just add everything we're going through right now onto it. It's hard not to get caught in circle thinking and, and, and how we're going to possibly sink. And when all that stuff starts to jive in in our hearts, minds, and souls, it triggers that ancient part of our brain called the limbic system. Now this limbic system, it shouldn't be demonized. It, it helps us survive. You know, the fight, flight, or freeze that happens when we are triggered. The limbic system powers our fear and our anger and our aggression. Now rational thinking and creativity comes from the parts of our brain elsewhere. But when we are at our best, we need to move beyond just our limbic system. And the best way to activate and get our brain boogie on, yeah, it's through prayer and meditation. I want you to look at this picture and listen to this quote from Mike McCarg, as I said, AKA Science Mike. Prayer and meditation cause increased activity in parts of your brain responsible for focus and concentration and empathy and compassion. Prayer is a remarkable way to escape the kind of negative thoughts that consume us and drag us down. Studies show that people who pray or meditate often change their brains in positive ways. In fact, even non-believers, adding the practice of prayer and meditation ignite the God spot in their brain. It, it changes the way they look at the world. Their spiritual awareness is activated. Truly fake it till you make it, you skeptics out there. The power of prayer. Crazy, but true. How do we pray then? How do we pray then? Well, for beginners and even for those of us who've been praying for a long time, a card suggests the Lord's Prayer. It's really a good prayer. I mean, it is the Lord's Prayer for heaven's sakes. But it is a good place to start because it addresses better living. And that which is recommended by neurologists who specialize in spirituality. Yes, there are neurologists who specialize in spirituality. It it provides ways to change your behaviors and your feelings. When we focus on God's love and goodness and are thankful and we forgive ourselves and others and focus on the goals for better living and our well-being, we can become better as well as our thoughts and our feelings and, and even our actions and thoughts about others. So let's get busy and pray without ceasing. As Paul encourages us remembering that though great trouble may accompany the word, we will be able to take great joy from the Holy Spirit. Taking the trouble with the joy and the joy with the trouble. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of feeling like we need to pray or something. So Ruth, take it away. Please join me in the prayers of and for the people. Steadfast hope. When we want to make all the rules so we can win every game, you call us to your side. You put your arm around us and whisper, play fair. When we tremble in fear, worried that our lives are about to crash to the bottom, you place us in the hollow of your heart and give us safety. Especially be with those whose names we now lift in this moment of silence. Word of joy, 
when we would follow those who pretend to be our saviors to achieve their own ends, you remind us that we have been chosen to be examples of faith to others. When we would fill our pockets with the treasures of temptation, you ask us to empty them so we can become servants of hope. Crafter of faith, when others judge us on our backgrounds, education, looks, you teach us how to treat all people as equal, to welcome each person as our sister or brother. When we wonder how our needs, our hopes, our lives will be made known to God, you mention us by name in all your prayers. God and community, holy and one, we know you as glory, grace, goodness, and lift our prayer to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now we come to a time in worship where we mindfully pause and gather in spirit around the welcome table. You may wish to pause this recording to prepare the elements at this time. Come to the one who welcomes each and every one of us to this table of grace. We bring our broken hearts so they might be made whole. Join in spirit with your sisters and brothers, remembering the one who gifts us with loving wisdom. The bread of life for all who hunger. The cup of compassion for a broken world.
please join us in our benediction. As followers of Christ, we have gathered for worship. As people of faith, we now return to the world. Go out to share the story of faith, the story of life with the world around you. We share the faith in word and in deed, in speech and in action. As you go out to give a living witness, as you go out to live out those lessons lived and taught by the Son, knowing his spirit goes with you, thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We are also grateful for the ways friends like you support the ministries of Park Street, either by online giving or through standard mail. If you follow us on Facebook, our next bi-weekly midweek meditation, Honest Offerings, will begin at noon on October 28th.